The reading today is from Genesis 2, starting at verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The virus is not a living organism. It is a tiny opportunistic particle. Those are the words of Professor Brendan Wren of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the Times a few days ago. He said, it doesn't grow in the environment, it merely tries to survive long enough until it reaches a human mucosal surface where it is activated. Well, viruses aren't proper living creatures, um, so say the scientists. I'm not a scientist. I know there's a debate among them, but um, the theme of this wonderful chapter, Genesis chapter 2, is the theme of life. What's life made of? What's it for? And uh, it's a real privilege and pleasure to share with you, well, with this lens in front of me and this microphone uh, stuck to my uh, shirt, but it's, um, it's great to virtually be with the St. Michael's Chester Square church family. I don't know how many of you are in Chester Square at the moment. I, I get the feeling that you're all spread out around uh, London and further afield even. I'm really grateful to Guy, my dear brother-in-law, for the opportunity to speak on Genesis chapter 2. And I love this chapter and it's been a real treat for me um, to spend some time in it uh, this week. And uh, You'll be glad to know that I've got three points, and um, they are, as I've looked at the text, and I'm, and I'm very grateful, it's one of those texts where I feel really grateful to have studied a bit of Hebrew and to be able to get into the original, and um, it's a, 
it's a beautiful uh, poetic passage. It's it's I mean you could almost see it as the the as the beginning of Hebrew poetry. Um, the way he shapes and crafts this this prose to be so poetic and culminating, climaxing in um, the first proper bit of poetry in the Hebrew Bible um, as Adam meets Eve. Uh, and one of the, the big features of Hebrew poetry that you, you may be familiar with is, well, you, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with whether you know it or not, is this idea of parallelism and where you put two ideas together, two thoughts in, in one line after the other, usually, uh, to make uh, together one big idea. And this is a, a theme that, that goes beyond the metaphor in this, in this chapter, where God is joining things together to bring life. And uh, so, um, and he does this in response to, to issues that he sees, problems that he perceives. God comes along to solve, and he solves through bringing things together, through connection. So the three things I want to look at are the, the issue number one is there's no plants. Issue number two is that humanity might get arrogant. And issue number three is that the man is lonely. So let's look at these in turn. Issue number one is that there are no plants. And God is looking at this creation that he's made. We, we think there's probably a bit of a break at, uh, at chapter 2 verse 3, to chapter 2 verse 4, um, there, there, there certainly is a break um, and, and whether chapter 2 is sort of retelling chapter 1 in a different way or following on from it, um, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of both it seems. But here we are at the beginning of chapter 2 and at chapter 2 verse 4 and the issue that God sees is there are no plants. Now, for those of you who are keen gardeners, you'll be saying, well, of, co of course, life without plants is uh, not worth living. You'll be saying, um, well, obviously, and I hope that those of you who eat um, can agree. Uh, we all enjoy the, um, the fruits, the vegetables, the plants, the, the cereals, the beans that, uh, that grow naturally. Um, but this was pre-plants, um, and God says... Um, this this is an issue that has to be resolved, and I, and I find it fascinating that he, that humanity is created in order to solve the problem of there not being any plants. When the Lord God, verse four, made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, the Lord God formed the man, and he also gave water. So God brought together humanity and water in order to make plants. <laughs> After chapter 1, making such a big point that humanity is the pinnacle of God's creation, made in the image of God, it's as if chapter 2 says, oh, by the way, your purpose is actually to, uh, to garden. Your purpose is so that there, there may be plants. There won't be plants without you. There was no man to work the ground. Okay, so in order for there to be plants, I'm going to make man. <laughs> I love it. Um, and uh, so God brings together, and, and, and so this is again, the connect, if, you, if you like, the, 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 if the offspring is the garden, if the, the thing that, the product that God is after is the garden, if the parents of that are water and humanity, the grandparents are earth and breath, God takes afar, he takes uh, dust, he takes humus. I mean, there's a play on words in, in English, which the, the new translation that came out um, last year from Robert Alter, he, he picks up that play on words and he said, uh, I haven't got it to hand, I'm sorry, but he, he talks about the, the human being made out of the humus, the topsoil. And um, so, and it, so, God takes the the humus. He, he he makes the man out of this clay, and then he breathes into him uh, life. Um, he it, it 
the commentator Gordon Wenham says it was like a strong puff to to get the man up and running. But the purpose is um, is, is for God to have a, a garden. Uh, so the, I said there, there was there were there were pairs all the way along. So the pair, the the earth and the the air that makes man, man together with the water makes the garden, makes the trees to grow, um, so that this garden can be cultivated. Um, and then you've got the creation here of a garden, a garden which is in contrast to the, um, well, the, the, the plain and the, the fields, uh, the land outside the garden, the, the, the expansive garden, as opposed to the, the expansive land as opposed to the enclosed garden. Um, you don't see the original word, but it's there. Um, the word for a plain or a field, um, sade, the open grasslands almost. It's uh, um, the, the land for pasturing. Um, it's there in verse far five. The shrub is literally, shrub of the field, there it is, um, and no plant of the field. Okay, so this is the NIV 1984. I don't know if the NIV 2011 still has it. And uh, it's there in verse 19 as well, beasts of the field. Uh, I think the more recent NIV has the wild animals. So the, there's a contrast between the, the animals outside the garden and the plants outside the garden and then the plants inside the garden. God wants there to be order and cultivation, there to be places set apart. Um, the, the garden seems to be an enclosed space. It's explicitly enclosed in chapter 3, but already here in chapter 2, we can see that God want, wants to bring order and he creates the human being in order to, to garden. So that has implications for us in terms of our attitude towards plants. And um, that I'm sp speaking to myself here. I am no gardener. I, I'm no botanist. Um, I'm... You know, my, my son came up to me this morning and said, look, Dad, look, the seeds we've planted with mum, of course, not with me. The seeds are starting to, to grow um, and sprout. Now, I love looking at plants. I do enjoy um, wandering through the, the forest. We've been living in Brazil. We've just come back from Brazil after seven very happy and very colourful years. And we were living very near the forest. Uh, Rio de Janeiro is blessed in having one of the biggest urban um, national parks and uh, the Christ the Redeemer statue is at one end of it and then it goes inland and um, we were very near that park and we used to go there on our days off and walk through the woods and enjoy the, the different smells and the different sights and the different colors of, of flowers and, and leaves, the textures of the leaves and the patterns, and the multi-layered forest. And that's, that's an uncultivated forest. That's not a garden. Um, but when we go to the, the botanical gardens, and uh, oh, there was another botanical garden a bit out of town that we went to for the first time um, very soon before leaving to come back to the UK. Oh, I wish we'd gone earlier to see the beautiful diversity um, of the, the plant life. And God wants us to garden. He wants us to enjoy the, both the sight and the smell of beautiful things to look at, but also the taste of them. He wants us to enjoy eating. That's where, you know, um, where, our, where Adam and Adam's food was from. It was from the garden. So that's the first issue that God sees. Um, and it's linked to the second one because it's almost putting humanity, putting us back in our place. Um, so the second issue is human arrogance. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. That was his purpose. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Chapter 1 can quite convincingly be read as a riposte to the other deities um, in the ancient Near East at that time, um, putting them in their place. 
oh, he also created the stars. You know, the stars are not divine beings. They are created by the soul divine being. Um, so if chapter one is putting these the other so-called gods of the ancient Near East in their place, that's part of its possible original message. Chapter two um, is saying, don't get big ideas of yourselves to men and women, to human beings, particularly to men actually here. Um, don't overreach, don't get arrogant. Um, and so God establishes these two trees in the center of the garden, the tree of life, a reminder that life is a gift from God, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A reminder that the knowledge of good and evil derives from God. God is the one who determines right and wrong, just as God is the one who gives life, without whom there is no life. Again, Wenham, to pursue wisdom without reference to revelation is to assert human autonomy and to neglect the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge. Guy said I, I'm able to use long words. I hope they still need explaining, though, don't they? <laughs> Unpacking. <laughs> we can so easily do what Adam and Eve did. We can so easily want to take from the fruit. In fact, we all do take from the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We want to decide what's right and wrong. We want moral autonomy. We want to make the rules ourselves. And as human beings, God says, if you want life, then if you want access to the tree of life, then that comes with denying yourselves the access to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which God could have not created. He could have just not, not put the tree there. But it's interesting that he does, that he puts the two trees there. And I'm sure that next week you'll think about this in a bit more detail as they, they take from the fruit, chapter 3. But the access to the life that God offers us depends on our um, abstaining from or drawing back from or denying ourselves what is properly God's, which is um, authority, lordship, uh, ultimate wisdom. From him derives life. From him derives wisdom and uh, justice, moral judgment. So there's a lesson about not um, overreaching ourselves. And this is a time, I think, for many of us when we, we had our prayer meeting with our church in Rio the other day. And one dear gentleman who's retired now, but is still very active in so many areas, um, very successful engineer, and uh, he said, oh, I just feel so useless. I feel like I'm not able to do anything at this time. And there's a real wrestle for, for many of us um, feeling like staying inside. It's just, how are we helping? And that's a good question to ask. And I'm not saying that the implication of that is that we should just stay inside and do nothing at, at all. Um, at least get into the garden. <laughs> but, um, but it's good to remember that, we, that life doesn't derive from us, and nor does wisdom. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The, the next issue uh, that God sees and wants to respond to is the issue of man's solitude. Verse 20, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. 
And so the Lord takes man and he makes woman. He uh, creates he, he, and he brings them together. And he, just as before, we saw that, that he made the garden through taking water and the man. And uh, he gave two trees, one to be eaten, one not to be eaten. And now he takes the, the woman and he brings her to the man. And the product is poetry. The product is delight and love. And again, the woman is made out of a pair of things, bone and flesh. Um, God is bringing together, connecting to bring solutions. He's a problem-solving God. He wants to confront the issues that he sees, and he's able to confront the issues that he sees, and he does this through bringing other things he's made together. And um, human relationships are God's answer to our solitude. Obviously, I mean, it's such an obvious thing to say, um, but it's also a, a thing that needs to be said. Um, Marriage is a, is a wonderful gift from God. Marriage is rooted in complementarity. Um, marriage is by definition heterosexual. Um, there's, there's got to be difference to, to make it a, to, to bring that unity that's gonna respond to, to, to man's solitude and that, that brings that delight of uh, one flesh union in marriage. Um, I had a, an email from a, a former member of our church um, who's been sort of accidentally separated from her husband during this time. And they wanted to be together, but she got stranded in a different country from him um, when the lockdown fell. And, and so they're, they're separate. And I, I was writing to her and it's... it's just not good to be alone. It's just not good. It's difficult for her at this time. It's doubly hard for them both. And I know that there may be people listening who are widowed, uh, who are divorced, who are separated, and uh, or who's single, or who are engaged and have had to put off their wedding. Um, and their the aloneness is, is is biting. It's difficult. It's hard. Um, now, I, I don't need to point out to you that this is just page two of the Bible. We're still on page two, and there's a lot more that God has to say to people in uh, loneliness and in solitude. There's a lot of hope and a lot of promise down the line. And if you are alone, um, then God loves you. <laughs> And he wants to bring you close to others. And he wants you not to um, experience uh, loneliness. He wants you to know the, the reality of his presence and of the reality of uh, community and relationship through the church. I can't go into that much more for now. But I want to finish by... Um, applying that, that hope more widely. Our God is a God who sees issues and wants to respond. He wants to connect people to himself. And through Christ, God comes near. He brings to us in the form of his son, connecting his humanity, his divine nature with our humanity. He's able and he's, he's shown us that he, he wants to solve our problems, the problems that are created down the line, the problems of us overreaching and, and our arrogance. Je Genesis chapter 1 sets a very high vision of humanity under God. Genesis 2 says, don't overreach yourselves. You have a purpose and it's to make plants grow and it's to um, remember that life comes from God through submitting to his wisdom and it's to enjoy fullness of life uh, in relationship with one another.